All right, I had a blooper, so I had to fix that. But I might as well get all of these videos out of the way. I try to pick a time in the day where I can just do a bunch of videos. And then the rest of my day, I can focus. But I want to talk about the whole gentrification issue. Because there's some people who, uh, you know, I'm, I'm someone who thinks that a neighborhood should definitely try to keep its character as much as possible. Um, and when I talk about it here, you have some people again, who are trying to come to it from a different angle. And when I talk about Hilltop being gentrified, which is a historically black community, and I talk about what's happened in the black community up in Seattle and gentrification, you have some bigots, because that's what they are, who come on and say, well, those people aren't improving their own community, which is a lie. These are people who don't live here and don't know what they're talking about. These are communities that have had businesses there for generations thriving successful businesses for generations so to say that they're not improving their community is stupid and uneducated what it is talking about is that the storefronts that are there the businesses that are there a lot of those people own the businesses they own the buildings some of them may rent and obviously if a, as more development happens the rents will go up because times have changed if you bought a building the the rent prices aren't going to go up or the lease isn't going to go up or the payments that you make is not going to go up because you own it but the one thing that will go up are property tax and here because we don't have an income tax property tax is used pretty heavily and so that helps push these existing thriving businesses out these are businesses that otherwise would do very, very well. Now, you can feel how you want to about black folks. Nobody cares. But, or any other group of people, nobody really cares. But what I do care about, and a lot of people care about, is the fact that these are businesses that support the community. And they also, people are working there. So they hire a range of different people for different things, depending upon the business. And so when that business leaves, those people are out of a job. Yeah, they can go and find another one, but it, it's, it, it shouldn't be the case. The fabric of the community should stay the same. Now, I also made the comment to the person that they probably couldn't survive here either. People are gentrified not based on race. It's based on, really, class, to be honest with you, a lot of times. Because even businesses in Seattle that are white-owned companies, organizations, various different groups are pushed out because they cannot afford it. And these are organizations that provide services that most folks don't want to do. But they're needed. When we talk about a lot of the other uh businesses that have existed and these are smaller businesses that they they have been staples in the community for a long time people here are very very serious about some of these businesses i'm not going to mention their names but they've been a staple in the community for a very long time and so people really want to support those businesses but then they get pushed out because of various different policies or due to just the economics of things Okay, so that's why it's important. And it also affects a lot of white people. Keep in mind, this area is mostly white. And a lot of the people that gentrification hits are white people, too, because there's this somehow there's this misconception that all white people are wealthy. And that's just absolutely not true. Or that all white people are in the middle class. And that's just not true. <laughs> there's some very, very, very poor white people. And there's a lot of them that live here. I'm, there's some that are close by that are being pushed out too because they can't afford, they're really our neighbors. They can't afford to live here any longer. So gentrification happens with various different groups of people. Now, yeah, I had some people argue with me about, well, it happens to white people too. Not just, duh. I mean, it's not a, it's, it's an economics thing. It's not about a race thing, right? But when you talk about whole entire historic communities going down the tubes, that's something that is a cause for concern. You obviously want that. You want to have those various different communities in a city. You don't want just to have a whole 
city that's just one way. You, you know, people that do, they can, there's some people that do, but you're not going to find it here. Anyway, that's beside the point. Gentrification, when we're talking about New York, as some people are saying, and you have some politicians who get paid a very good, handsome sum of money, we're talking about Amazon creating gentrification. Okay, now these aren't communities that these politicians live in necessarily, if they're talking about this, but <laughs> they're talking about gentrification of New York City. New York City is one of the most expensive cities in the country. When you build a new subway line, you're creating gentrification. No one talks about that. When you build a subway line, there are times when where they put stations, which you typically, I do have to say they do it right there. Unlike here, here they put a big monumental building as a station and then you go in and they two, put two or three down. New York is just a hole in the ground. You go down that little hole and then you're there on the platform. Here it's a big giant building, but it, that's besides the point. But a lot of times when they have the maintenance facilities, they clear out a whole section of town, of, of, of a neighborhood, and they put up a maintenance facility. That's gentrification too. It's just, I mean, people call it something a little bit different, but it's, they're gentrifying the community. They're taking people out. And they don't talk about the fact that New York, Manhattan pretty much runs New York. It does. It's where all of the, the massive amounts of international business and all that stuff is. The, the city will always gentrify. Every city, unless you're in decline, but every city that adds a significant number of people every year is going to face some sort of, in business, is going to face some sort of gentrification. So even though where Amazon was going to go maybe would have sped that up, that doesn't mean that's still not going to happen. So you don't attack a bit, so you have to stop progress just so that you don't have gentrification? No. If anything, because I mean, think of it this way. If you, if you go to Hong Kong, for example, and I've been to Hong Kong, you have buildings that, and, and companies that do a tremendous amount of business every single day. I remember going to Hong Kong and there's a chariot that they have in the in the lobby of a hotel that's made out of gold. <laughs> okay? But then right next door to it is a what they call a public estate, which is public housing, but they call it a public estate. Looking at the building and the surrounding area, you wouldn't think that. You couldn't tell it any from any other building. But the way that Hong Kong does it and some other cities do it is they put buildings wherever they need to put buildings, right? They, they put them where they got to go. Now, they do have a more distinct, unlike in Japan, where you can put buildings wherever. Residential, commercial, it can all be mixed together and there's no specific zone. Hong Kong does have a bit of a zone where you have more commercial buildings as opposed to residential but you see this mixing of buildings everywhere. And so when you're walking around, it doesn't feel like you're in the hood. It just feels like you're in a big city, right? And Hong Kong doesn't really have, at the time, now this was over 10 years ago, I don't know now, but they didn't have really a set minimum wage. So people were very, very poor and you had extreme wealth. I mean, they have more billionaires there per capita than any other place on the planet. So they're still able to make it work. I know we're not Hong Kong, but they're still able to make it work because of you have to have the right policies. If you look at America and you have to tailor it to the country and tailor it to the community, <clears throat> what they're, let's go to Tacoma, for example. Here, we've learned from what happened in Seattle. And so now what the city is trying to do and what Seattle is trying to do 
is create programs for affordable housing. And what they're doing is they're taking land that's available and they're building and they're telling developers, we will offer you incentives similar to what was going to be offered to Amazon if you build affordable housing. New York City had tons of buildings back in the day. If you look back in the 70s, there were buildings in New York City that looked like it was a war zone. Shells of buildings empty, and we're talking for a long area. And New York could have, like Chicago could have, and many other cities could have, and a lot of American cities are, are behind the, so it's not just New York. And they still can. They can take areas of the city where there's no development at all, or little development, or sites where there used to be industrial facilities and there's no longer industrial facilities. They have to invest money in those communities because, or in those sites, because a lot of them have contaminants, depending upon what the factory or warehouse produce. But let the city clean that up with the state's help and then offer incentives for developers to build affordable housing. This is not building the projects. This is building affordable housing, right? This is building housing for people who are working jobs. Because, you know, I saw a story last night, I forget what station, but they were talking about how these New York workers were going all the way to Amazon's fulfillment facility and the different transportation modes they have to take to get there and how much money they're getting paid and all this other stuff. So New York knows kind of what the neighborhood salary is. I mean, every city knows that. So work that out with developers. If you look at uh, Seattle, for example, and I did a video talking about this, Yesler Terrace is an area where they're focusing on affordable housing. It's connected to all of the trans, not all, but it's connected to uh, the streetcar, First Hill Streetcar, which connects you directly to the light rail system. So either way you go, on that line, you're going to run either into the International District where you can get on the light rail system and go everywhere, really, because it's King Street Station. You can go sound or do a lot of different things, or you can go up to a, a different part. I think it's Capitol Hill. I can't remember now. It's been a while. And you can get on the light rail station there, right? So it th they basically wanted heavy construction there in terms of very dense big buildings because of the simple fact they have built up the transportation network there to move more people and that section of town is very close to downtown very close to a lot of different things and people will have access that's 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 the whole point and these are people who are working so this isn't like they're you know i don't know if they're in government assistance or not i, I don't know but these are people who are working, but they can't really afford the the high market fluctuating rents. They just can't. So developers offered incentives to build so that they can keep these, you know, they don't have market rate apartments, basically. Or they have a percentage that are market rate and then some that are not. So you have a kind of a collaged community where you have people of various different incomes living there. Some pay market rates, some don't. It's just a whole mix of different things. And so you add vibrancy to that community because you can have a whole different potpourri of different types of businesses. So the neighbor may not can afford that one restaurant that's right under the bottom floor of the building, but you can. Or the neighbor possibly likes, you know, has a job as a server at that particular establishment, but you are working for Amazon downtown. I mean, it's it's that's kind of the point is that you have different people who do different functions, different jobs, they have different skill sets. That's the whole, that's a city, right? You can't just have a city where everybody's making a huge bunch of money. It doesn't work like that. Life happens. People have different choices, different options. That's what they do. So instead of pushing companies out, because what this does and what people aren't thinking about is New York is very tax heavy, okay? Very tax heavy. You're losing companies as we speak because of it. 
the 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 approach that they took with Amazon is not a good approach. I don't think anyone would agree with that. It's not a good approach. And what it does do is basically say we're not going to you're not welcomed if you're too big. Then what happened? And then they they label it and say gentrification. Well, then people will say, why don't you do something about it, New York? Because you you have the ability to do so. You have the ability to do so. I mean, you you have areas of the city and you can create certain specific tax districts. I mean, if you want to really tax, tax some of the big, huge monument, and they may do, I don't know, in Manhattan. Create certain districts. You can create what's called a TIF district. Now, I don't know if it's a tax incremental financing. I don't know if it's allowed in New York State. Some cities and some, well, some states will allow for a TIF district. It has to be passed by state legislature. But again, you have the governor that's there who can possibly make that happen with a state congress. And you have the city of New York, the mayor, who can also help push that and create a TIF district, a special district where as developers put money in, they get money from all of the, the development, things like that. The state is getting money. From property tax and some of that goes back to the tip district to the city so they can do more investments they can do, use that to buy more land they can use that to do a lot of different things fix up properties that are brown fields or what have you there's so many different things that a city has at its disposal but you can't sit there and blame companies that they're going to create gentrification because they would it's going to happen I mean, it's going to happen. I mean, the standard of living goes up every single year, whether a company moves into your city or not. I mean, people in the middle of nowhere, food prices are going up, everything's going up. And no Amazon's coming there or no big company's going there. Everything goes up. Everyone's property taxes sometimes go up. The cost of power. One of the big complaints here is to come with power or to come with public utilities. The bill that people get is so astronomically high. People complain about it. So there's so many other things that can lead to gentrification other than a company. It could be policies that the city does. It could be the taxes that they create that also creates gentrification. And that's something that the citizens need to talk about. Politicians don't mention that, that the tax policies that they create are also causing gentrification to hit a lot of times. So then when you run a business, and especially if it's a big business, they look at that and say, really? Tell the whole story. So all that's going to do is ha give an incentive for companies to say, it's not, worth the, it's not worth the hassle. Amazon has so many options. It's not worth the hassle. Apple, they've invested a lot of money there. And people say, well, they invested money. They didn't get any sort of incentives and blah, 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 blah. Apple is basically renting space. And it's not a headquarters. Actually, they got put their headquarters in Austin, and Austin did offer incentives. They were not massive on the scale of what Amazon was going to get. But also, Austin is not going to have as much as many employees and as much development as what Amazon was promising either. I do think that Apple's approach was much better. Don't get me wrong. There was some wrong that Amazon did. But to just basically say that gentrification is going to happen and so therefore you shouldn't have Amazon because it's going to happen because if they come in, everything's going to go up. We're talking over a long period of time. They're not bringing 25,000 people there today. They're not. New York's economy, if you compare it to Seattle's economy, New York's economy just completely dwarf. I mean, like we have, no, we can't even compete <laughs> with New York. Their their GDP, I think, is a trillion dollars. You know what I mean? Like it, they have a tremendous amount of economic power there. Seattle is, I don't know, maybe three or four hundred billion dollars, if that. So the city has money and how they spend the money, you have to look at the folks who are running, who are running things. 
There are things that they can do to help solve the issue. Now, they can't eliminate it completely. They're not going to be able to stop a lot of people from being forced out because that's going to happen. It, it just is. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's going to happen. So, you know, some people a lot of times will say, well, you know, gentrification, you know, I'm tired of hearing about it. You're saying no to business. No, I think that business should happen. But I also think that companies like Amazon should also invest in the communities as well. There's a lot of things that I think that they should do. I basically, as I tell people, I bowl down the middle. You're not going to find me a lot of times just heavy in one area. I can see kind of both sides of the argument. And this is a case where you have to call it what it is. And that if the city is making the argument, some people are making the argument that gentrification is going to push people out. I guarantee you that eventually that's going to happen anyway. Especially if the city does nothing. If the city or the county or the state does nothing in terms of providing more affordable housing, you know, eat, you know, relaxing some of the taxes and the tax burden, you're going to have that happen. The gentrification I am against heavily is when they basically, especially... And this is the argument that I was trying to make last time or whenever I did the video and somebody completely missed it, was when you have a university or a hospital come into a community, typically a black community or a person of color community, and they basically use eminent domain and they push the entire community out. That has happened several times. It happened in my hometown. That I'm definitely against. Because Amazon can't use eminent domain to push people out like it's a, it's a private business. But if there is a facility that's going to be for the public good, or if there's a project that's for the public good, cities or organizations can use eminent domain and force you out. And it's not just a couple of houses. It's an entire, you know how big a university campus is. They can force an entire neighborhood out. And that's happened in Bowling Green. That's happened in a lot of places. So that is a problem. I don't like that. Because then you're basically going, you're forcing out people who are of a particular demographic where you can put that particular institution anywhere. Especially when we're looking at my hometown of Bowling Green, Kentucky. The university took a whole huge black community, wiped it out, and put down a university, and they could have put that university anywhere in Bowling Green. It's tons of land. I mean, there's you look at it. There's land everywhere. They could have easily put it anyplace else. We're not talking a huge sprawling city. It's not like if they chose five miles to the east or three miles to the west or a few miles north or south that it would have made that much of a difference. We're talking a very tiny town, especially back in them days. So that's what I have an issue with. But this particular situation for New York is a loss. It is. Now, people will say good for New York, but when you think about the tax burden, when you think about the subways that aren't going to get fixed anytime soon, when you think about the companies that are actually leaving, and when you think about the fact that gentrification is slowly going to happen, you see the buildings they're building right there in Long Island City, those glass pretty buildings. You're going to have gentrification anyway. may not be as fast. I'll give you that one. But you're going to have it. And if the city does nothing, which is probably going to be the case, then you're going to start seeing people go through more issues. And the problem is, too, they're going to bring in some companies that don't have the political, that don't have the financial power that Amazon has. And those companies are not going to be suited to help. You could have argued for community centers. You could have argued for them to help fund education. You could have argued for them to do a lot of different things. But then you have a company that's a middle-sized company that doesn't have the funds. It doesn't have the ability to do that. Amazon is just sitting on cash. Facebook's sitting on cash. I mean, those are companies that you can easily have that can throw $100 million to something. But some of these other companies that you go across every single day don't have that ability to do that. So anyhow, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, I will see you. Take care.